Okay, I'm going to kick us off. Hello, welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit, and thank you for joining us for today's session. So, you want to print and sell your open textbooks with Kevin Hawkins. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director at the Open Textbook Network, soon to be the Open Education Network. If you're not familiar with us, we're a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OTN. I am today's facilitator. I am joined by Tanya Gross, my colleague and director of educational programs, who uh, will be moderating the questions with me for Kevin. Before we begin, I'm going to share a few details with you. The hashtag for the summit is OTN Summit 20, and you can find us on Twitter at open underscore textbooks. The session is indeed being recorded. The video and transcripts will be posted on our YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. We are saving time today for your questions. The last several minutes of the session will be devoted to that. To submit a question, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. If you'd like your question to be anonymous, you certainly have that option. Simply tick the box. We may not have a chance to get to all of your questions, but we'll do our very best. Please know that we are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. Finally, there is a button for live transcript at the bottom right of the Zoom toolbar. If you'd like, you can turn that on for auto captioning. And now, Please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Kevin Hawkins. Kevin is Assistant Dean for Scholarly Communication and Interim Head of Library Research Support Services for the University of North Texas Libraries, where he leads the library services in support of graduate student and faculty researchers. Prior to joining UNT in 2014, he was Director of Publishing Operations for Michigan Publishing, the hub of scholarly publishing at the University of Michigan Library, which includes the University of Michigan Press and other brands and services. And as you know, today, is going, today Kevin is going to talk about printing and selling open textbooks. So I'll turn it over to you now, Kevin. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, glad to be here with you all. So as Karen said, and as you can tell by the title, I do want to uh, talk about some of the things to think about uh, if you want to print and sell uh, versions of open textbooks, because I think there are a number of things to just sort of think about in this world before jumping right in. And so I want to kind of talk a bit about how the book supply chain works and different type of printing operations there are out there, and then walk through some of the questions that you should be asking yourself about this. So, uh, to start with, I want to go over a few terms just to sort of make sure we're all on the same page. They're terms that I will probably end up using and, and coming back to in this presentation here. So a print run is a, is a, is a set of books, uh, copies of a book printed at one time, right? So um, traditionally in printing, it's more uh, uh, efficient to print a whole bunch of copies at once, right? So you print a couple hundred or a couple thousand or whatever you eventually sell through them and then you print more. And over time, you, you likely print, have smaller print runs uh, as demand for a new book goes down over time. Uh, the supply chain uh, for books, um, as with other goods, um, uh, involves um, distributors, right? The sort of main starting point here for things after they've been printed. Um, these distributors can handle sales and order fulfillment. Um, and, um, but then there are sometimes others in the supply chain, like wholesalers and bookstores. And so what happens is the distributors actually sell on consignment to whole wholesalers and bookstores uh, at a, a discount from the retail price, right? And so then those uh, wholesalers or bookstores in turn are selling down the chain uh, closer to or at the retail price. And so they're keeping the difference here. <clears throat> um, but it's on consignment, meaning that the unsold inventory uh, is um, uh, eventually refunded, right? So at the point that, say, a bookstore decides they're not going to sell any more copies, they would either ship them back to 
uh, wholesaler or distributor up the chain um, uh, and get their money back. Uh, or in the case of like mass market paperbacks, actually, they sometimes don't even bother sending them back. What they'll do is like rip off the cover and mail the covers back as proof that they didn't actually sell the book. Um, but it's not worth anyone's, uh, it's not worth the shipping cost. Um, <clears throat> but for many other books, you do, in fact, ship them back. Yeah. Okay. But um, the world moved on a bit. And so um, these days, uh, a lot of printing, uh, especially for smaller niche titles, is done with digital printing. And so this can be short runs, that is, small batches, maybe um, a couple dozen uh, copies at a time. Uh, or print-on-demand technology, where an order is made and one copy is printed to, to meet that order here. So as you can tell, this allows you to replenish your inventory in small increments, right? You're not having to commit to uh, 500 copies at a time, for example. This facilitates the long tail publishing for niche audiences, as I've said. Um, and this sort of technology is um, today is generally available in the supply chain, uh, so a publishing house, uh, publisher, um, you know, uh, is often working with a distributor and or wholesaler that has this technology right on site so that they can fill order, fulfill orders directly, print them right there, um, you know, package them and ship them out the door. Um, but then there are also lots of um, the direct to consumer options these days um, where like a self-published author or a very small publishing operation can like log in their website, set up their, their new book, uh, make it available right there online, and then people can go to buy it from there online. Um, so you probably even encountered in some of these, um, you know, a service like Lulu, um, Kindle Direct Publishing, which is part of Amazon, um, Ingram Spark, you might not have heard of, but that's from Ingram, which is one of the major uh, book distributing companies that also works directly with, with, um, with publishing houses. So, um, you know, there's kind of a range of options out there these days. And the other kind of preface I want to uh, uh, do is talk a little bit about versions of open books. So <clears throat> one of the virtues of, of open publishing online and using a platform like Pressbooks right, is that you can continually update a book. And the tool lets you um, very easily update the print ready PDF file. But you should know upfront that there really aren't good workflows out there for um, um, having that print ready PDF kind of go into a, a print on demand for sale supply chain, right? So there isn't, at least I'm not aware of a way that you can um, set something up where someone could buy a nice pretty printed um, bound version of the latest PDF file from your Pressbooks website. Um, this would have to be something more manual, like someone would have to kind of go download the PDF file and then put it somewhere um, right at that moment. So um, you would, you, so you can't quite do that. Um, so if you're going to have a print version of a book, it needs to be a snapshot from some point in time. But actually, I think that's a virtue because if you um, are um, um, updating an online textbook, say in press books, um, that's something that you kind of need to be careful with anyway. When you, especially when you do it like in the middle of the semester, because your own students and students at other institutions may be using that book and may be confused as things are changing along the way. And so, um, as many of you probably already know, it can be um, useful to have a policy of only updating your online books, the public version, uh, say like once a year at sort of in the off season, like in early August. And um, similarly, you would um, need to do that for any print version as well. <clears throat> so, um, and, and there's a second point to this as well, which is that you know the whole publishing world um, built around print runs also uh, assumes that we have discrete new editions of books, right? Um, we've all come to expect that any copy of a book uh, of a particular edition of a book is going to be identical. So again, you don't want to be making tiny changes as you go along the way. Um, sometimes publishers do this with fixing errata, you know, tiny errors. But in general, if you're going to make a significant update of the content, you typically update the title page to clearly identify the new edition. You assign a new ISBN because it's now a different product. And maybe you even pull the old edition uh, off the market, right, out of commerce. So these are things you'd want to be keeping in mind if you're going to be updating a book over time. All right, so here are some of the questions to consider in thinking about how you might go about 
um, printing and selling uh, uh, a version of an open textbook. So I think the first question to think about is whether you plan to sell these books um, at cost, what it costs to actually manufacture them uh, and ship them out, or do you aim to generate some revenue from each sale here? So if you're gonna sell at cost, this is simpler in some ways. Um, th so there's no tax implications of this. Uh, no one is making income off of this. Um, so no one has to account for that income in income taxes, whether it's an individual or organization. There's also your sidestepping any ethical implications um, from um, profiting from the textbook purchases of, of your own students. So this is your own textbook. Um, there's, no, there's no issues here with um, you potentially making some money off of it. But if you do want to generate revenue, then there's a bunch of questions, which I've essentially already alluded to here. Um, so is the revenue going to be going to the author, or to the institution, or is it going to be split in some way? Is it going to flow through the institution to the author? perhaps because the institution ends up setting up the book for sale uh, and then is essentially paying royalties to the author. I need to keep in mind though that if the institution owns copyright in the book because it was produced with significant institutional resources and that may be the institution's policies there, um, the author may not actually have any right to the revenue without that being explicitly agreed to by whoever on campus gets to decide these things, perhaps your tech transfer office. There are, as I said, accounting and tax implications here. So there's um, revenue that's coming in to the author or the institution or both, and that all needs to be accounted for when filing income taxes. And um, institutions often have policies about instructors assigning their own books, uh, needing approval for such, thing, uh, for such things, um, or really it's just, again, an ethical kind of question, even if there isn't a policy, um, uh, should the instructor be profiting in any way from the choice of textbook? <clears throat> the next question is whether you would um, produce one or more print runs or do print on demand only. So a print run does require an upfront investment um, here, right? So you're paying for 500, 1,000, however many copies of this book to be printed. But when you do that, you are basically always going to get a lower unit cost than if you do print on demand, right? So each book costs less to print than it would if you did print on demand. So you have the potential to make more revenue in the end. The problem, of course, is that you've had to sink a bunch of money up front, and you may not end up ever selling those books. And so then it's kind of a lost cost here. Um, even if you are going to sell these books, you're not going to sell them all right away. So they need to be stored somewhere until they're sold. Someone needs to handle receiving the orders and payment and shipping to wherever those customers happen to be. Um, they're probably not all right there on campus. So this isn't something you can just sort of do out of a departmental office. Um, now, this is not something that you really would need to do on your own. Um, you can pay a distributor to handle these things. Um, and there's plenty of choices to do that. And they're very good at this sort of thing and can handle them, right? And they can take orders by all different methods of payment and all those great things. Uh, do keep in mind that they generally are going to charge you to store the unsold inventory until it sells. So they have some sort of way where they're selling, they're charging you every month for like the number of bins of books that are on their shelf. So um, this can be a reason not to do such a large print run up front, right? Because um, even if you get a better unit cost or you have the money up front um, to do that and you want to spend it, then you may be stuck um, paying this small monthly fee every month until they manage to sell out of inventory. Of course, if you do print on demand only, there's no upfront investment here. I mean, maybe a minimal kind of one-time uh, setup charge, but um, basically you're not investing in any printing. The unit cost though is higher, which means the minimum retail price is also higher, right? And you have to sell enough to recover that cost of printing here. Um, the printers that do this basically are all set up to do fulfillment as well. So it's all basically uh, all wrapped into one. But there's a big question here about whether bookstores will ever stock this book. So I explained this whole consignment model earlier. Um, bookstores basically are only going to stock a book if they know that they could return it. And so if they have a pure print-on-demand book, they're not going to stock it because they have to sell it. Otherwise, it's a total loss. Now, some bookstores will, in fact, uh, if a customer walks in and says, I would like you to order this book for me, uh, I will pay you, then they will do that as a one-off. That doesn't happen a lot anymore because 
people tend to buy things online anyway, right? But um, some of they, they would do one-off orders like that. But this could matter if you're thinking about textbooks because um, uh, a lot of times you have students who are receiving financial aid that can only be spent at their campus bookstore or they have a scholarship that similarly requires that. Um, for example, at UNT, all of our um, uh, athletes on scholarships, um, they get money that has to be spent at one of the bookstores, not even the official campus one, but it's an off-campus one. Um, but it's some deal that the athletic department struck, right? So those students have an incentive to buy their books there. Um, with our bookstore contract, we have a Barnes & Noble store. Uh, technically, the contract says that university employees can't refer students to buy books anywhere else except the campus bookstore. This is not like it's really easily enforced or, or, or vigorously enforced, but technically there's such a requirement. So you couldn't even put up an open textbook and then send people to a link to buy the book uh, somewhere else and tell all your students to do that. So, um, so these, these things can complicate an arrangement um, for print on demand. Another question is whether you'd be printing the book in color. Covers are basically always in color. That's not an issue, but it's the interior. So it's much cheaper to print the interior in grayscale. So not just black and white, but any shades of gray um, because of the way digital printing works. Um, but you know, textbooks often have diagrams in them that can't easily be represented in grayscale, right? So it's much more expensive to print in color. Um, because of the way the digital printing works, especially with print on demand, um, you essentially need to say the entire interior, interior is in uh, grayscale or the entire t interior is in color. You can't sort of mix and match the two to try to save money. So now the entire interior of your book is, is color, that's quite a bit more here. Um, and if you have photographs that need to be reproduced as photographs or reproductions of artwork or something like that, this is even more expensive because you don't want to use the sort of standard paper that you would use in um, just ordinary textbooks. You need a thicker um, and glossier kind of paper here. So all of that drives up the cost a lot, uh, especially for print on demand here. As I mentioned, the covers are always in color, um, but um, there are different ways you can bind a book. There are simple paperbacks, um, but then there's also different kind of hardcover bindings that are often used for textbooks. So there's case binding, um, the kind of firm backs. Um, it's often, um, you often print an image right on it with a kind of glossy cover. This is very commonly used for like school K through 12 textbooks. Uh, and then there's cloth binding, um, which often has a dust jacket around the outside. So both of those are more expensive than paperback. And um, just trust me, there is no economical way to print less than 500 copies at a time with a color interior and hardcover binding and sell for a reasonable price. Uh, I've, I've, I've worked with authors who are really set on doing this and you just can't do it. You know, the, the, you have to sell it for like at least $40 a copy or something for even a small book and like people don't wanna do that. There's just no way to do it here. So um, that really rules out hardcover binding for, for, a lot of, uh, for a lot of open textbooks. Another thing to think about here is where are your customers? Um, if you're only selling to domestic customers, like in the US, um, you have plenty of options. Um, you know, as you all know, there's plenty of ways to ship things within the US uh, very affordably. But shipping abroad uh, raises all sorts of extra complications here, right? Um, is customs at the border um, reliable? Are mail and parcel services reliable, right? Um, book distributors will ship overseas, um, but they often require traceable shipping um, so that they know if it gets there. Um, and so that if you tell them it doesn't get there, they know whether they're sending another copy and that's quite expensive. Um, large companies like Amazon don't bother with this because they just eat the cost if someone um, says they didn't get it. Um, but um, book distributors in my experience won't do that. Um, the largest print on demand vendors do have locations around the world that will help speed things up. So they'll print it in the location that's most appropriate, but even they, again, aren't gonna bother shipping to certain countries because they know that customs and mail and all this just aren't reliable enough. Um, and so you need to investigate that ahead of time. Obviously in this day and age with, with um, you know, more and more learning happening online and, and students maybe you know, um, stuck abroad in other countries, even if, you, if you're at a US institution and, and you know, you're only doing this for your own students here, you may in fact have students um, who are uh, abroad in the near term here. And so um, if, you, if you are expecting them to be able to get this print option, um, it may not actually be um, reliable or 
feasible for them. I will say that um, I've had some conversations with people who um, say write a book that is about a particular region of the world and their interest in a print version has more to do with reaching people in that region than it does in reaching a domestic audience here. Um, in those situations, I think it's worth looking into um, a local printer, <laughs> essentially. Um, right, so, so um, you know, for example, if you're trying to reach people in India, um, work out an arrangement with a printer in India that can ship within India and handle all of that. Uh, and then just say, you know, users in the US just access the online version. I think you're gonna have, um, even though of course finding and making that arrangement initially um, could require some additional work, I think you'll actually get um, better results all around. <clears throat> I do wanna mention though that um, in all of this, um, and hopefully you're not getting too scared already from all the complications I've presented here, that there may be some options to pursue um, that could build on local connections um, here. So I've talked a little bit about campus bookstores, you know, um, uh, bookstores, especially those that are, you know, part of a larger network, right, um, like Follett, Barnes and Noble and such, um, are kind of plugged into the larger supply chain and um, have options for things like course packs, right? So Barnes and Noble, for example, um, already has ways of doing custom course packs and helping faculty with producing those um, and making delivering both uh, online course packs and print course backs, right? Made of um, material being reproduced with permission from other rights holders. Maybe they could work to get your book set up as well. Um, and you can make a good um, relationship with that, with that unit on campus here. Similarly, if there's a university press at your campus, or if you're part of a state that has essentially a statewide university press, uh, they may also be able to help with this. They use print on demand, almost certainly, um, and are all kind of plugged in the supply chain. So they may be able to um, get you in kind of under their, under their contract for print on demand. It's probably, um, they probably have better rates than you're gonna get on your own. And they could also potentially handle distribution if this is something that might have a, a big enough market where it'd be worth printing copies. Um, uh, university presses will often take on um, um, titles from say small like local history societies and other kinds of uh, scholarly oriented organizations that don't have their own printing operations and they will distribute titles on behalf of them. And so they may be able to distribute titles uh, on behalf of your uh, open textbook services here. Uh, and in fact, um, <clears throat> if you were looking for your authors to get royalties directly on their own, then um, those authors may be able to work directly with the campus bookstore or university press, and then you don't have to be in the middle of all of that. Certainly easier on administering something like uh, royalties here. So my advice here is that, you know, if the author owns the copyright in the work and is going to be receiving all the revenue, if that's the, the, the plan you've made here, the arrangement you make, then I think it makes sense for them to set up the book directly with some print on demand service um, and that you don't have to be in the middle here. Um, you may be involved in helping producing the book up until that point and you have the final uh, PDF of the interior and the final PDF of the cover, but then let them take the files from there. That to me seems like the way to go if the situation is like this. Um, so um, that's kind of one piece of advice, but for one narrow situation. Um, uh, I have kind of alluded to some points of advice otherwise, but otherwise I really would just be happy to take your questions and comments on all of this um, and, and address the things that are most uh, on your mind. Hi Kevin, Thank we you do Kevin have for sharing all of these uh, questions for us to consider. Uh, there is one question posted so far and I encourage other attendees to go ahead and, and use the Q&A to ask additional questions. So if a bookstore prints an OER textbook, can they charge cost only or can they add a surcharge? If so, is there an acceptable percentage they can charge? Well, I, I think the bookstore would decide if, if, if they're gonna charge a surcharge here. I mean, I don't think, that's not something for me to say really, that would be up to them to decide if they want to. In terms of an acceptable percentage, like I guess you're asking kind of what would the going rate be? 
Uh, that's a good question. And I actually, I don't have a sense of that. I did earlier allude to um, how distributors and wholesalers um, would sell kind of down the supply chain at a discount. That varies depending on whether, just this would give you maybe some sense of things. Um, how much of a discount there is depends on whether it's a popular trade title that would be stocked in bookstores or whether it's something of, of narrower interest like an academic book. And, and also it depends on how much market influence they have. But those discounts kind of run in the 30 to 50% range. So basically they're buying the book at that discount and then the extra there, the 30 to 50% of the retail price is what they get to keep. Um, but I mean, but, but really this is a different, this is a different kind of question because it's, there's a different type and amount of work here involved in like helping to set up a book for an author. So I don't know, but I guess I'd go ask, get a price and then have the author shop around elsewhere. They could look on, you know, Lulu and Kindle Digital Publishing and such. Um, these services, especially the ones aimed at, at end users, uh, have like online calculators. So you put in like how many pages and what's the trim size, like height and width of each page and, and this and that. And it will tell you like how much it costs to print each and, and you know, how much they get and how much you get and all of this stuff. So, so you can really just kind of work out those options. Now, have you seen any instances of working with campus duplicating services or copy services as a way to provide print on demand? Um, well, so, um, so yes, they're often campuses often have their own um, local print shops and um, those have long been great options for things like course packs, print course packs. But uh, I am not aware of any that have their own print-on-demand equipment. Um, but it's worth asking, for sure. Maybe your campus does. And what do you consider the best pipeline that you've seen from a Pressbooks PDF to a print-on-demand copy? What kind of um, print-on-demand providers do you think work well for Pressbooks PDFs? Um, I haven't done it directly. I believe the Pressbooks documentation um, uh, says a little bit about this, about which specs they meet for the interiors. So I would consult that. As I recall, though, of course, the Pressbooks does not produce the cover. And so you need to do that separately. Uh, it's a somewhat manual process because um, it's not as simple as designing something with the same um, you know, trim size, height and width, but you also need to get the width of the spine correct. Um, in my experience, printers uh, often provide a, um, a kind of cover generator. Um, so you put in all the specs of number of pages and type of paper you're printing on, because paper has different widths and all of these things. And it will like give you a, um, like Adobe InDesign file that has the basic pieces in place. Uh, like here's a box where the front goes and the back and the spine, and then you kind of overlay your design on it. So they provide some tools to help out with that, that sort of thing. I think the trick here is that um, self-service things um, like, um, you know, Lulu or Kindle Digital Publishing or whatever, um, you know, you really need to be able to kind of do it yourself and upload it and just have it work. Um, they may, sometimes they'll offer some kind of full service services where they'll help you through it. Um, the bigger um, printers that kind of work directly with publishers sometimes have staff on hand who can help like tweak things and fix things and all. Um, but those, you know, they're not used to working with people for one-off projects. Like they want to establish a relationship with someone who's going to bring them multiple books to publish. So you can't really send authors to them generally. Um, maybe you can broker the relationship, but it gets a little tricky. Uh, and they too don't want to do all the work for free. And so, you know, if they have to make corrections, then they're going to want to charge for that as well. But at least with those, sometimes you can have a point of contact for questions and clarifications. And so that can be helpful. Point of contact is always helpful. Okay, Kevin, do you have a rule of thumb about what percentage of students will purchase a print copy of an OER that is freely available online? Oh, I don't. Um, I feel like I've read some anecdotal reports on that, um, but I can't remember where at this point. Um, so I don't have a good sense of it. I know I think it depends. I think there's a number of, 
think there's a number of factors in all of this, right? I think, um, first of all, um, how the textbook is listed in the, in the um, schedule of classes and the text in the uh, bookstores list, whether it's listed as required, the print version is listed as required or optional, um, can affect things. Because I think some students kind of just look at the list and they just go and they just start buying things and they're not, you know, they're not, it's not until they get to class that they may learn that there's an alternative version available. So that can affect some sales there. Um, also, how does the instructor frame it, like on the first day of class? Um, but I think it also has a little bit to do with the material itself, uh, you know, and what, what type of book this is and what type of course it is. Um, you know, my, uh, my suspicion is that the more likely it is that the student will be annotating the reading, the more likely they are to buy a print book. And similarly, um, uh, the more, if, if this course is sort of a foundational course or part of a sequence where the students would have some sense that they're gonna wanna go back to it later, then they'd also be more likely to buy. But this is all quite anecdotal, as you can tell. So um, I wish I had some more concrete numbers to offer. Thanks, Kevin. And if there's anyone in the call who does have that top of mind, feel free to drop it in um, the Q&A. Basically use the Q&A as chat. Yeah, um, I'd love to hear some new numbers too. Because I feel similarly. I know I've read this somewhere, but I can't recall right now what exactly it is. So Kevin, can you please speak to the Creative Commons non-commercial license and how that factors into print considerations? Ah, uh, yes, that's a good good question. So, um, so as as you all know, um, one of the Creative Commons licenses, well, one of the um, attributes of Creative Commons licenses is whether uh, uh, commercial uses are allowed without asking for permission. So can you make commercial uses under the license without needing to ask the rights holder for additional permission? And there's been confusion about whether um, things like what I've described uh, would count as commercial uses here, right? And so if the instructor is going to make a little bit of profit off the book or the institution is gonna make a little profit off of each sale, um, would that count? Or if the, um, the printer here is a commercial entity, does that matter? And so there's actually been a couple of recent um, court cases um, under US copyright law. Well, this is essentially contract law actually, that help, have helped to illuminate this. And the findings in the US have been that what matters is not the status of the entity doing the copying, but of the entity that has sort of ordered the copying. So the example um, was along the lines of a school um, asks um, Office Depot or someone to make, to essentially produce a bunch of um, print course facts uh, of some material license under a non-commercial license. And um, I, I think the rights holder then like, you know, sued Office Depot. I, I'm not getting this exactly right, but it was something like this. And it was found that actually, because the school district itself was a not-for-profit organization, that's what mattered. It didn't matter that they, they happened to outsource this work to Office Depot and Office Depot happened to make a bit of money off of it. What sort of matter was the main motivation? So how does that fit with what I've talked about today? Um, I think that um, if you work for a um, not-for-profit educational institution, in the US, which is pretty much all of us, I think pretty much every OTN member would fall in that category, uh, then, um, and you happen to use a commercial service for the print on demand, I think that is probably fine and you could use it even for non-commercial items. Um, however, if, if, um, if the institution or the author is making some royalties, then maybe not. I'm not a lawyer. This shouldn't be taken as legal advice. Thanks, oh, and Kevin. great, yes, Karen put in the, the um, yes, thank you, thank you. Perfect. Great, really and there. thank you to the two attendees. You both agreed that 10% is the general number you have heard in terms of uh, ordering OER print copies, so thank you. Uh, collective mind for helping us recall 10%. Great. All right, here's the next question, Kevin. 
have you seen any print-on-demand vendors that include accessibility options like large prints or different contrast ratios between type color and paper stock? That sort of handle this automatically, like you send them a book that's not especially uh, designed for this and that they're going to produce adapted versions. Yeah, that's a good clarification. And while I wait to hear back, I imagine it could be something similar to, well, now I'm just making up technology, but um, perhaps something similar to the um, book cover design, you know, make your own cover um, tools. But I'll wait and see um, if there's any clarification on that question from Ellie. Okay, next question. The legal case with Office Depot is the Great Minds case. They were trying to sue the commercial entity as an independent licensor, but it was determined they were considered as agents working under the school's license who is using it in a non-commercial manner. Thank you very much, attendee, for uh, contributing that. So there are no questions in the queue. I will just um, invite everyone, anyone to add questions or clarifications uh, to anything Kevin has shared so far. And if I don't see anything in the next um, few seconds, we will conclude our time together. Well, we haven't gotten a clar clarification on the accessibility question yet. I mean, so I guess I'll kind of venture a bit in the direction here. So. I'm not aware of any um, publisher that does any sort of automatic adjustment or sort of fixes for accessibility. And even large print editions, as far as I know, um, it's always the publisher that um, lays out the book again um, in larger print with different pagination and all of that and makes that um, happen. So, uh, so I'm not aware of anything automatic. It, it, you know, it's essentially not, I think it's not as straightforward as something like, um, um, you know, uh, uh, turning over your ebook files and, and having an organization go through and like fix them for you because of the kinds of adjustments you tend to make in print there. Um, I don't know, maybe interesting business opportunity. Yes, and we did get a little bit more clarification as you were expanding. So say your InDesign prepress file is at 12 point font could a user specify increasing the fonts at the time of printing? So it would be, I, I'm imagining like a personal print on demand. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I'm, I'm, no, I don't, I don't great think, idea. I don't think there's any way that, yeah. Um, because really, I mean, the printer, um, the printer doesn't have the InDesign file anyway. Um, basically the way it works is you uh, save that InDesign file as a PDF. Um, and you give them that. Um, they don't want to mess around with the original InDesign file. Um, there's too many things that can go wrong, essentially, um, or won't look exactly as the way you intended. So, um, so yeah, it would be up to you generally to, to, to increase the font size and reflow the text and make it all work out and, and send a new version or an alternative format. One, of course, main difference is the world of um, audiobooks. Um, uh, so there's, uh, there's, um, I mean, that is a kind of separate world. Um, uh, publishers tend to make uh, separate arrangements directly for those to be produced anyway. Um, as you may know, there are certain uh, exceptions uh, in US copyright law that allow um, um, certain designated organizations to make their own audiobooks, essentially, even when one's not available. But that's, that's its own separate thing. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Couple more questions have come in here. So for librarians referring faculty who are interested in print options, would you start with online self-serve options or with on-campus contracts like the bookstore? I mean, so, right. I've, that's a tricky one. I mean, um, if they're doing it, you know, it's, it's their own personal work. Again, they have the rights, they're gonna get the royalty. It can be most straightforward for them to make their own personal arrangements. And that doesn't even involve going through any particular you know, campus accounting or something. Um, but if it's the bookstore, you can, you know, well, whatever, not during the pandemic, but you could like walk over there and talk to someone and like, <laughs> you know, talk to options and you can, you have that point of contact. And so I think that can be attractive to people. Um, and again, I think it can be useful 
just sort of for us politically to sort of build in those connections to campus bookstore, university press, whatever, the local print shop. So I think those are attractive for their own reasons. Um, especially if you have a whole set of books or you expect to have more, or if the institution, institution here is involved in, um, in, in facilitating this relationship or it has the copyright and it's gonna get royalties, then I think all the more reason to build on an existing relationship like that. Next, we have a helpful tip from Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. She finds it helpful, particularly for OER under an NC license, to request a cost breakdown for the print job. We work with our bookstore's preferred printer, and they have been willing to provide cost breakdowns upon request, but they won't typically volunteer them, so you have to ask. And they work with Zan EDU. So thanks, Michelle. And Emily has a question regarding the large print version. So say it is possible to provide a large print sort of secondary PDF. Um, if I'm understanding her question correctly, would, the, would it require a second ISBN if you had um, a version that was uh, large print? Yes, you're supposed to do that. Um, not just sort of by, by the rules of ISBNs, um, but really because um, if someone's ordering a book um, and they have an ISBN, uh, in theory, they know exactly which format they want and they want just that one. They want large print or they don't want large print. And so that's the point of having separate ISBNs there. ISBNs have lost their usefulness a bit in the age of Amazon because Amazon gives their own identifiers to everything. Everything has its own sort of link there. So people kind of point to things unambiguously that way. But um, by having ISBNs, you're not locked into the Amazon ecosystem. And so that has its own advantage. Great. Okay, next question from Angela. At my college, we do have students that need disability services like large print or an audio textbook. And we have a contract with an on-campus UPS for printing. Is there any restriction for our faculty who make the OER to provide the student a better printing PDF for their use as well as the book for a non-disability student? Hmm. So I, I think, so I think here's what's meant. So I believe these services, um, what they, what they will do is they might try to reach the publisher to get the sort of original PDF. Otherwise they're going to scan from paper and use that as a starting point, which is very inefficient. And so, um, the question here is, well, is there any reason the faculty member couldn't just provide this, um, um, uh, Office of Disability Accommodation, whatever it's called, with a um, with the sort of original PDF that would be a much better starting point. Um, if the author owns the copyright, absolutely not. They would have be in full rights to do that. If the institution owns the copyright, um, I would think that you, as an employee of the institution, could um, give another part of the institution a copy of that same book. Also, no issues there. So. Um, Unless there's some third party involved in all of this um, with the rights, I, I think you're fine there. Uh, or unless you've signed, yeah, I mean, some agreement, but really print agreements with printers are not exclusive. So um, it's really about the publisher. Um, and if, 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 if your institution is the publisher of this open textbook, I think you're fine. Thanks, Kevin. The next question is about I think using the print on demand company tools to prepare a file for print. So any tips on how to resize a PDF file that the POD company says is too large or anything sort of in that vein when you run up against that print on demand company saying something's not working with your file. Yeah, that's tricky. I mean, really, um, Things don't go well if you're trying to like re like adjust the PDF. It's really better to go back to the source of that PDF file, if at all possible. So, um, assuming it was created from say InDesign manually, then you go back there. Now, if this is the PDF that came out of Pressbooks, that's where you may be running into some issues here, um, right? Because it's the tools kind of generating it automatically behind the scenes. Um, I don't have any. I don't have any particular tips to offer there. I mean, there are certainly are tools, including Adobe Acrobat, that can edit PDFs in various ways. But to do something like try to resize it, I mean, you can you can adjust the um, the like page size, margins, trim size, and all of that in Acrobat. That part's easy, like adding some extra spacing around the edge. 
or, or kind of cropping, but you've got to get all your terms right because there's differences between the page size, the bounding box, the trim, like all these things are actually terms from printing, but they matter. And I, to be honest, even have trouble keeping them all straight and, and, and doing things exactly right. So um, that could be tricky, but um, you know, it might be worth, um, if this is a common issue, um, you might um, um, uh, hire someone who does um, um, book design and cover designs, like freelancer, uh, who could help you out with some of these things. <laughs> someone you could pay for an extra hour or two of work here and there to help out with some of these things. That might be the, the way to go. Thanks, Kevin. It looks like we have addressed all of the questions that came in. So I am going to thank you on behalf of the Open Textbook Network and attendees for joining us today. And I will also thank the attendees and the audience for your questions and your contributions to this conversation. As I mentioned earlier, a recording of this session will be available along with Kevin's slides, and we look forward to seeing you in future summit sessions. Farewell.